Okay, and now we move on to the next and final speaker. We go back to the US where we connect with Alex Kaplan. You are working for the IBM Watson Education and you will be speaking to us on education, keeping up with advanced technologies, looking into the future there, into some dangers and threats and uh, immense possibilities that the artificial intelligence, blockchain, and all other options bring. So we're really excited to having you here with us today. Thank you. And uh, please, the, yeah. well, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you so much. So yes, as you mentioned, uh, I'm going to talk about the work that uh, IBM is doing in the area of advanced technologies and education. Uh, that's the work that I've been focused on uh, over the last many years is the intersection of advanced technologies uh, and how they can support educational outcomes and key stakeholders in the education system. So I think it's important to understand that the uh, world is going through another major transformation in terms of technology. So if you think about the time frame of the technological revolution, you know, we started back in the tabulating systems era area. Uh, era, which was about uh, a decade ago, I'm sorry, about 100 years ago, uh, and over the last 50 years, we've moved forward to uh, now what we're in, which is considered to be the cognitive systems era, and the thing about cognitive systems that are different from the prior eras is that we're really at the point where the technology, the computers themselves, can provide deep insight into information uh, that they're working with, can draw conclusions, and can communicate with humans in a very different way than they were able to do previously. So we're entering into a world of Alexa and Siri and Watson and other cognitive technologies, uh, which allow a very deep and very different uh, user computer uh, experience. And this has very direct implications for education. Now, I'm sure all of you have heard all the hype about artificial intelligence, about how it's gonna take over the world and how robots are going to uh, replace humans. And, you know, I have to say it's, it's mostly science fiction. So it's really important to understand the reality of what's going on out there versus the science fiction of it. And while the science fiction is incredibly compelling and interesting, you know, the reality is, is that what we're talking about are machines uh, that can be trained to do very specific kinds of things and are incredibly good at doing specific kinds of things. So the way that we like to think about that is not that artificial intelligence is going to take over the world, but that artificial intelligence is going to serve to augment human capability. Now, where I think that the disruption is going to come from, and it's already started today, is that anything that can be handled that's a very, very well-defined process uh, that can be handled through step by step by step. So sort of think of, you know, factories where every step on the assembly line uh, is highly developed. Every step on the assembly line is highly known. It's taking one piece and putting it in place and then moving on to the next. Any process like that uh, is very prone to being uh, replaced with artificial intelligence. And you can see this happening in all sorts of areas. Everything from restaurants uh, where you can go in and you can punch in your order and uh, the computer will make your pizza to autonomous vehicles. And so there are a lot of areas of the economy where we think artificial intelligence is going to uh, take over a lot of those core functions. But what this really means is that humans will need to shift in terms of the kind of skills that they develop and how they'll continue to work with these technologies to guide them. So the way that IBM likes to think about this is really more of a partnership between humans and, these, and machines. So rather than thinking about artificial intelligence as a replacement for humans, it's best to think of artificial intelligence as an augmentation to human intelligence. Cognitive systems excel at uh, analyzing very large quantities of data and locating it, uh, pattern identification, they have endless capacity for storage, they never get tired, uh, they can communicate with humans in natural language, they can learn uh, from the mistakes that they've made, where humans really excel at things like common sense, morals, abstraction, dilemmas, and so on. So if you think about uh, environments where there's a lot of information that's available, we don't have the capacity to really process and to think about that information organically, but computers have that capacity for us. However, computers really don't know what decision to make. So, you know, they look at the patterns of the data and the information, 
but they can't factor in the natural world and the kind of judgments that we have about other people. So when you think about this in the context of education, it's a very important area because in working with, with children, with parents, with professors, whoever's involved in the stakeholders, you know, we, we know each other well and education is ultimately a social activity. So what we want to use artificial intelligence for is we want to use it to augment the capabilities of people who are involved in the education process so that they know more about who they're working with and they can provide better guidance and direction and support as people move through their careers and, uh, you know, uh, seek, uh, move through their aspirations in terms of what they'd like to do with their lives. Now, one of the reasons that this is so important is that the world is becoming awash in data. And much of this data is currently untrusted, but it's growing at an absolutely exponential rate. And the reason for this is everything in the world is becoming wired. We're all experiencing this. Everything from our smartphones to our refrigerators to our toys to our textbooks, everything is becoming wired and everything is generating data. Now, within that sort of chaos of data that's being generated out there, there's tremendous potential to take that data and to start to get insights that we couldn't previously have. So as an example, in working with students, if we watch how students interact with online learning programs, if we understand where they're getting stuck in terms of working their way through a textbook, uh, if we see patterns in their lives through social media about things that are impacting their ability to learn, we can now begin to look at all of that information about a student and we can have a much broader view of who that student is as a human being and we can think about how we can help and we can support that person. So we can move away from this very simplistic view of academic achievement that's based upon grades or passing a test and we can start to look at a more multidimensional perspective on who this person is and what their interests are. Because academia and formal schooling only takes in one component of our experience, one component of what we're learning. It doesn't capture things like internships or our activities outside of the classroom or the work that we're doing. That we're doing. Um, it really is very, very focused. But with this proliferation of data, we can start to have a much broader and more universal view of who that student is therefore being better and able to help them. So this is where cognitive computing and blockchain tools come in. They help us cope with this data and they exponentially enhance digital uh, intelligence. So there are really four primary things that these advanced technologies can do for us. One is to help us understand. So I've discussed previously the quantity of data out there, the need to process it. Computers do a wonderful job of looking for patterns accessing information and trying to extract meaningful and relevant uh, information that we can then use to, to think about. And so they're very good at understanding data sets. They're also good at reasoning. So they can look at underlying concepts, form hypotheses, and infer and extract ideas. Now, they can only do this in the context of the data that they have and the information that they know. And therefore, this reasoning really has to be complemented with human interaction, human reasoning, human sense of the world, because what they're reasoning on is a data set that's very limited and they're drawing conclusions from it. And it doesn't take into account the fact that humans change, people change as they grow, their interest changes, their knowledge changes. So whatever a computer is doing in terms of reasoning, it's doing is based on historical data, but it has no sense of where that person's trajectory is in the future. This is why it's so important to think about these tools as augmented intelligence for humans as opposed to this science fiction concept of replacement. Computers are also very good at learning. So as they each see each data point in this interaction, they can learn from that. They can make, you know, they make mistakes and then they can correct those mistakes. This can be very powerful in terms of uh, human computer dialogue where the computer is talking with a person and if the computer asks a question that we would consider dumb, uh, you can correct it, you can explain why it was dumb, and the computer will not make that mistake again. So it's a very powerful tool for them to learn how to interact with us as well as how to analyze data. And finally, we're at the point where they can really interact. They can talk, they can hear, they can see. Uh, and this allows them to operate much more in the way that we work and allows it, us to change the paradigm of human computer interaction from one where we were trained to talk to computers the way computers like to talk now computers talking to us the way that we like to talk. And that's a very powerful change. And it opens up the power of these technologies to a much broader audience uh, who can actually begin to work with them because you no longer have to be literate on the technologies. 
you can just communicate with them the way that you would with, with another person. So how are we applying this? So IBM is tackling, tackling really important problems with these advanced technologies. Everything from making the uh, food supply chain uh, safer to helping young children learn uh, how to uh, have learn vocabulary words. So we're really focused on where can these advanced technologies have an impact. So in the case of the work that we're doing with Sesame Street, when young people come into, young children come into kindergarten, uh, given that uh, uh, kid's background, they come in with a very uh, big gap in terms of the depth of knowledge of their words. And teachers, kindergarten teachers, have to spend a lot of time in helping close that word gap. But we think that technologies can help support the teacher in doing that. So we've worked with Sesame Street to develop an application based on artificial intelligence that provides an almost a game-like experience for young children to be able to learn words. So it's a very exciting application of this. Then in terms of food supply, you know, there's a, a lot of importance in understanding how the food moves from farm to table. Uh, and so the blockchain technologies that we're using allow us to track a case of lettuce all the way from the field, uh, all the way to the restaurant and through all the suppliers. So if there are health issues related to that box of lettuce, we can within seconds identify where that box of lettuce came from. And just in terms of the efficiency of that, just to give you an example, uh, Walmart did a study on how long it takes uh, in the existing environment uh, to trace that box of lettuce, and it can take up to two weeks. And with blockchain technologies, they can do it in two seconds. So when you have this kind of insight into the farm to table movement of food, if there are issues or concerns, um, you can quickly identify where those issues and concerns were. So these are both great examples of how we use advanced technologies to augment human decision making, uh, to help support and teach learners in the case of Sesame Street, and to help assure that we have a safer supply of food in, in the case of food trust. So we see educators using these computing, cognitive computing and blockchain technologies to really focus on the student experience gap. So a lot of education that's delivered in the world today is really based on the old paradigm, old industrial model. But in the future, it's going to become more and more based upon this advanced technology model, where we're using the technologies to develop personalized learning pathways for students. We're helping provide teachers and other educators insight into who that student is and what they need to know. We're making textbooks smarter. We're making the experience that students have with the technology simpler and more interesting. And this uh, lines up very well with what millennials want um, around technology. They expect that in their education experience that it's going to work much like Netflix or Amazon or any of the websites that the, uh, the services that people use, and they want to consume their education in the same way. It's also going to, get, going to provide a lot more freedom for people. So if you think about education in the future uh, with these kinds of advanced technologies, if I'm interested in uh, pursuing a degree in veterinary health, I might be able to assemble that myself from a whole variety of education providers, do some of it in a classroom, do some of it online, get an internship at my local veterinary, uh, veterinary office. And by using these tools, I can bring that all together to demonstrate mastery of skill. So very exciting potential outcomes in terms of giving people more freedom, more choice, and also our ability to provide uh, education more broadly around the world. You know, we're very fortunate uh, in the United States and in, in Europe that we have access to a lot of education uh, at a very uh, reasonable cost, but that's not generally true throughout the world. And after uh, people uh, address their needs around uh, food and housing, the next most important thing on their list is education. So we have to think about how can we deliver high quality education to billions of people around the world, help them get educated so that they can uh, they can attain the aspirations that they have for own, uh, their own lives. This is a very important problem to solve. So we're doing very specific things in this area. Um, you know, we're really very focused on how can we apply this in the real world. So with universities, we're helping them understand which students would be best suited for their institutions, something we call prospect advisor. Um, institutions tend to know what the profile is of the students that would be successful there. We can help universities think through that. We're working with students to help them understand uh, how to move through a program and get their degree. 
so that they can sort of make the trade-offs about what career they want, but they know uh, much more clearly um, what their personal learning journey needs to be to uh, attain their objectives. Uh, we're working with students on helping them with a particular course so they can see what homework is due when, uh, how they should move through that homework, when that should be made available. Uh, we're embedding cognitive technologies within textbooks themselves so that as a student works their way through uh, in these instructional technologies that there's a tutor assistant on the side who can help um, provide them guidance if they're struggling with a concept or they need additional information. And we're working with uh, people as they move through their careers in terms of understanding how the mastery of their skills lines up with career objectives, what adjacent careers might be, uh, and how to think about moving through it through one's careers. Blockchain is another interesting dimension to the advanced technologies that we're working on. It's a relatively new and emerging technology area. Uh, in this area, our focuses are on around credentials. If you think about a credential, whether that be a diploma or a badge, what a credential is really about is demonstration of mastery. And demonstration of mastery can be more than just academic. It could be an internship, it could be a Boy Scout or Girl Scout badge, it could be work that I did on the farm. Uh, it can be all sorts of experiences that people accumulate through their lives. And if we can demonstrate mastery and provide a broader palette of mastery skills for people and capture those to a blockchain, we can make that available to potential employers. We can make it available to education institutions if we're applying to school. So we can get a much broader view of who that student is and we can give the power of those credentials back to the student. So we like to talk about this in terms of unlocking the value of credentials by providing an individual with a, uh, a credentials wallet. That would be uh, sort of the, uh, you know, their lifelong learner record, they're captured, they can share with others. So as they move through their career, move through their education, that they have a record that they can take with them uh, that's immutable, that's transparent, that can be trusted, that they can use to serve their own purposes. And we're very big proponents of the fact that people should own their own data and that that data should travel with them. And the reason this is so important is that as people move through their careers and they accumulate credentials, uh, you know, you can lose track of those credentials, your university can go out of business, I mean, there's all sorts of things that happen where credentials disappear. Uh, you can be a displaced person and you can no longer access the university. So we want to be able to give people those credentials such that they own them and they're portable with them. Uh, so this, again, can change uh, how people uh, move forward in their careers, how they go through education and so on. So just to give you an example of how blockchain works, this is uh, an example of somebody who wants to become a nurse. Uh, you can see that Alex is doing clinical work at the hospital. Uh, to get towards her bachelor's science and nursing degree. Uh, when she gets her bachelor's degree, uh, that degree gets written to the blockchain. Uh, so now she's got that blockchain in her wallet. Uh, now she wants to go and take the nursing exam. So she passes that exam and the certification of passing that exam goes into her wallet. She now has her bachelor's degree in her wallet, her credential wallet. She's got her nursing exam degree in her credential wallet. And so she's going to use that to go apply for a job at her local hospital. Uh, the hospital is looking for really qualified nurses. They look at Alex's um, credentials and make that decision uh, that she's a really good fit and they offer her the job. So this is a much more efficient process. It's quicker. Uh, and then, uh, you know, it's possible then for the hospital to look at those credentials, to independently validate them, and it makes it much easier for the recruiting and hiring manager. Now, this is going to solve a lot of problems uh, in the credential world. So if you think about credentials right now, um, you know, 66% of organizations are already active on credentials. The reason that they're doing that is because a lot of credentials in the world are fraudulent. Uh, and, um, you know, organizations that work with credentials need to see that problem solved. We also think that it will remove barriers, as I've talked about previously, in terms of providing incentive systems around the credentials. And once you have much greater trusted data on the blockchain around credentials, you can use these to create much more refined personalized learning pathways for people, which augments their overall educational experience and provides new tools for them to better guide their own, uh, their own careers. Now, just to end up on a, you know, a more sober note, so we need to keep our eyes on a lot of issues related to this. So there's a lot of potential and a lot of power in this. But there are also things that we really need to concern about, we need to be concerned about and that challenge our thinking. 
So security and privacy certainly is uh, critical, uh, really high on my list of concerns is the fact that um, the way the world is set up today, much of our, our personal data is being used and harvested by others for their purposes, not for our own. Uh, there are a lot of people who can hack into these systems. You know, there's case after case after case of this. And so we need to keep, 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 keep our eye clearly on providing security. Uh, we think that people should own their own data. Privacy should be up to us, not to big companies. And that we need to make the world more secure and more private uh, in order to continue the acceleration and use of these technologies. The second area, and I think this uh, particularly of concern in the education domain, is algorithmic bias. Remember, these advanced technologies make those decisions based on algorithms, based on existing data sets. And the fact is, as we program these systems to work, we're programming in our own biases inadvertently. So we need to keep our eye on algorithmic bias so that as we create these cognitive tools of the future, um, that we can minimize and eliminate bias as much as, as much as possible. There's a lot of work going on in this area. A third one is filter bubbles and profiling. So as I mentioned previously, what these cognitive solutions do, these advanced technologies do, is they work with historical data they can't see into the future. And I think that there's a strong risk around uh, profiling, where based upon historical data, you could have a student who was really struggling, who had some, uh, uh, some issues um, around uh, their behavior, uh, interactions with others, and one could end up profiling that student, and that profile could stick with them, and that would cause the way people interacted with that student going into the future. But people change, and we need to be respectful of the fact that people change and be very careful that we don't allow filter bubbles and profiling uh, to work their way into these systems and to override uh, our view of people and recognizing uh, the, ch the potential for change in people. There's measurement fallacy that comes to play here as well, believing that somehow the data uh, means things that it doesn't mean or means more than it really means. One of the issues in terms of measurement fallacy is that we really don't know how some of these advanced technologies reach the decisions that they make. Uh, this is a rather large area of concern that when a computer makes a recommendation based upon complex data sets, we're not really sure how they got to that conclusion. So these, these can lead to measurement fallacy issues and again, an area where there needs to be more work. Another one is observation overload. We're all being bombarded with information. Some of it's relevant, most of it is not. And so just keeping in mind and trying to figure out what do people really need to know to do what they need to do in a very specific kind of way, and as opposed to bombarding people with information. And finally, this data can be used for sales targeting and usage and for commercial purposes. And you know, we need to be very careful about allowing that to happen and keeping monetization out of it from this perspective. So there's a lot to consider there uh, as we move forward in the world uh, of advanced technologies in education. And I think that uh, all of us have experienced and I'm sure share these concerns uh, around the future. So. Many of these are public policy issues in addition to being technical issues, and there needs to be an ongoing discussion and debate about the policy side of this as the technologies continue to advance. So key takeaways here. So cognitive computing and blockchain, these advanced technologies will transform, continue to transform uh, work uh, and education. Um, education is struggling to keep up with this. This is an increasing challenge. Um, organizations, we believe, need to embrace these technologies and to figure out how to work with them uh, and the way, best way to work with transformation, which uh, really has never stopped. It's been going on now for, what, three decades, and it will continue for decades to come, is to make sure that technologies are aligned organizationally, uh, that it's focused on the human, that that's the frame of reference. How do we help a student? How do we help a professor, a teacher, and families? Uh, there needs to be an data strategy around all of this such that uh, the data that an institution is collecting is very purpose-driven uh, and it, it has very intended outcomes. It should align to workforce requirements and finally organizations will have to be agile going forward into the future. So um, you know this is an area of high professional interest to me, uh, something that I've spent uh, many many years working on. I think that there's enormous potential in this. There's always been a lot of interesting work to do uh, there's a lot of interesting work still yet to be done, and you know, I'd welcome uh, anyone who wants to stay in touch with me to connect with me on LinkedIn. 
uh, and you know, feel free to share your ideas. I think about all these important topics. So thank you very much. Great, thank you, Alex, for this uh, really interesting and well thought provoking presentation and all of your insights and your rich expertise that you've shared with us. Now, I know you have to run in two to three minutes, but let's see whether Rasmus has a question for us. Rasmus, what would you like to highlight that has come in? Okay, hi again. So, here's a quick question. Uh, Alex, in the future, who do you think will play a major role in setting standards in education? Do you think technology companies will be, will be playing a greater role? Well, I think that technology companies will collaborate in setting the technical standards. So uh, the way that these data sets can interoperate, the way that, the, uh, that they need to work together. So just at a very pragmatic level, uh, if you're going to have really effective personalized learning pathways, then you have to have a scope and sequence uh, that uh, we can apply those data sets against. So uh, I think that, you know, uh, that's really what the technology companies need. And then standards around what's the schema for, uh, you know, for a, a badge, what, what's really in that from a data set perspective. But I think that the most important part really are the policy decisions here around things like what are the curriculums, what kind of outcomes do we expect from our students, how should those students be measured uh, on demonstrating that they show those outcomes. And what the technology companies will do is provide a whole set of tools and technical capabilities that allow people um, to uh, to achieve those objectives and, and demonstrate that they've that they've achieved them. Great, thank you very much for this, and thank you for being with us today. Now we know you have to run, so thank you for having shared with us also your contacts, and I'm sure that many of us will be coming back to you because those things are, well, as you say, the future is here and the future is now, so it does bring a lot of concerns with us. So thank you again, and uh, bon voyage. <laughs> we know that you are traveling, and but we do hope to connect with you at uh, at another point in time later on. Thank you very much, yeah. and uh, good luck to you. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye. Thank you. So, Rasmus, uh, you are in Germany. I'm in uh, Slovenia. Our speakers will have been all over the world. Um, how about if we try to uh, see what were the main uh, or uh, particularly interesting questions that have uh, that have come up yeah sure what would you say were the most uh, were the most pertinent issues uh, that you have seen uh, today well yeah there's been quite uh, a lot of stuff um, very different stuff well let me think about it um, I think the um, monitoring uh, aspect of teaching quality is, is a good one. How do we monitor um, the quality of teaching in online education? That is a question I, I like a lot. Was there a lot of activity in the chat box? Oh, in the chat, actually, um, in the chat box, it was uh, a bit more silent than we hoped. Um, there was, was more the questions that we have been talking about uh, in advance. Okay, thank you for having monitored that and thank you for having come in with all the questions that you that you shared then with our speakers whom I would like to thank again uh, for uh, having been with us today. Uh, Rasmus, you are staying with us and now I'm joined by Nicole and Kim who have been administering the back end of our online event and uh, big uh, thanks to both of you. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the speakers already but you uh, have prepared a couple of takeaways for us and for our participants today. What are, would you say, the main uh, points that we can take away from today's online event? I, it was really interesting to hear all the different speakers and all the different points of view. Um, one thing that stuck out to us as we were listening was accessibility um, issues, not just you know, getting access to internet, but also gender issues surrounding access to education, um, even online education. So I think that was an important thing to think about, especially as we're, what are we called? Right now we're a, a panel of women. I, one of our uh, supporters called that like a, what'd she call it? A fat, a fanel, <laughs> a female panel. Anyway, 
<laughs> right. So gender would be one of the things that we don't necessarily think about in terms of accessibility of online education, but it could be a dimension that plays a role. Kim, what do you think? Um, I thought one of the interesting points was we had, one of the reasons we started this project was that there wasn't a general agreement on what governance, how, how to define governance. And what struck me was we had a, a, some very interesting and variety of definitions of what is a teacher and what is a virtual teacher. So I think there's a whole conversation that needs to be to happen around that. But at the same time, um, I really appreciate what Cellini said about educators being change agents and saw a lot of parallels across the presentations about the roles that educators had, but also, again, the importance of considering context. So for me, that was, um, that was important. So the second thing I'll add quickly is, um, back to the governance idea, is again, this idea of self-governance um, and the roles of various partners. I, mean, I think that came up um, in all of the presentations, how not only um, the government or, um, different textbook standards were setting things, but how we as individuals, as teachers, as educators, and our different roles, and including what Alex just said about technology companies and setting technology standards, what this new idea in this more cognitive science world looks like of what self-governance means as well. Right, so governance, self-governance, agency of all involved as well. And Nicole, would you like to add anything to this wrap up? I mean, I guess it was just so fun to see all the different people in all the different places come together. I was really impressed with the Pennsylvania um, virtual school program. They seem to have really thought that through and just have a real handle on how they're delivering virtual school, virtual education to students. Um, I don't know, Kim, what, what's that to you? Um, same, I was impressed with, uh, with, the, with all of them, but I think what was interesting too is we looked at um, cases across, I mean, in Pennsylvania, Florida, India and then Alex doing really global work and I think what surprises are really I saw a lot of parallel surprising ones between um, what's going on in India and what's going on in Pennsylvania in terms of how they conceive the the student and take the student into consideration and I think too um, just a, across all of them about how we define teachers so I think um, as we think of online education we focus sometimes on the differences of countries I think we also look to look at the similarities and the common objectives that every one of our presenters speak uh, said and what we feel as well is this passion of in getting involved in changing education and how it's done so i think um the more that we can find common language i think that's something denise said in her presentation as well find common language find common grounds to communicate and, and open up these types of discussions in the future um, the more opportunity for change there could be Right, thank you very much to both of our hosts and the organizers and the starters of this project, the idea mothers, we would say, or the concept developers of uh, what we are doing here today. So a great big thanks to you both for all of the work that has been put into this project. A great big thanks to all of our speakers and of course to everyone attending. We still have people listening and I will um, use this time that we still have to say a great big warm thank you to all of you who have been listening to our podcast, who have been following us today and who have been joining us uh, through chat or other means. Uh, we um, have been monitoring the chat box and we are still going to be doing that. So please don't hesitate to get in touch and to share whatever you need, want, or uh, would like to share with us. Now, all of the presentations have been recorded and they will be made available on YouTube. Our project has a YouTube channel. So you will be able to see all of the presentations and hear all of the speakers' recordings on our YouTube channel. If you registered for today's online event through Eventbrite, you will be uh, made aware when those recordings are made available. So you will be notified via email when the recordings will be available. And if you did not register through Eventbrite and you are just joining us today, please go to our website, which is uh, projectungoverned.com and then there you can sign up for our newsletter at the top of the main page and then we will add you to our emailing list and you will be notified. 
of where the recordings are and how to access everything. And if you still have questions and would like to get in touch with our speakers, all of that, all of the contacts, all of the information is also available at our website. So basically, for any questions, any follow-up, we are most happy to have you. Please don't hesitate. Connect with us through our website at projectungoverned.com. And of course, we have social media accounts. So we are on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, on YouTube, as said. So please do follow us and uh, you will be able to access all of the materials and get also insights into our background information, our photos, the backstage, the preparations, uh, and everything else. So girls, what do we do? Do we wrap up? Kim, I think, did we have one last round of thank yous we wanted to say to the team? We really appreciate everybody on our team who worked with us. Um, you saw in our PowerPoint, but without the team, this wouldn't have been possible. So we really appreciate it. Hey, Rasmus. <laughs> we got you back in. <laughs> He's, are you a little bit camera shy? Yes, I am. You should be. <laughs> You've been supporting us so well with your questions and the monitoring of the chat box. We were always happy to have you back in. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks so much, everyone. We really appreciate it. Thank you, Kim. Kim, we can't hear you. You're muted. Thank you. I just also want to acknowledge the two people you can't see on screen. Um, Yelena, who has been diligently tweeting throughout the event, and Matthias, who is uh, in Indonesia and hopefully sleeping by now. <laughs> we'll be uh, taking care of the YouTube um, videos. Um, but thank you all very, very much. And um, thank you for joining. Great. So this was the online conference in the framework of Project Ungoverned, the project dealing with the uh, aspects uh, that concern online learning from opportunities, options, threats and dangers and the immense possibilities that it offers. We have had a series of podcasts produced and we will have a series of recordings as based on today's presentations available on our YouTube channel. We are also on Medium if you prefer to read instead of listening and uh, all of the scripts of the podcasts are available on our Medium channel. So please do find a channel that uh, that uh, appeals to you, follow us, stay with us and we will be posting more shortly. So thank you again. And well, I hope to see everyone soon again and wish everyone a good day or a great evening, whichever is suited. So thank you very much and see you very soon.